higher yields may mean less need to raise rates. You had Jefferson saying, we'll keep in mind tightening impact of higher yields. We're going to get more Fed speak today. Tell us why you think the Federal Reserve is now focused on the move in interest rates as opposed to higher for longer. Right, Maria. Well, I think the Fed is focused on higher interest rates because, you know, long-term Treasury yields have gone up a lot since they last hiked in July. Uh, they were up about 40 basis points between the July and the September meeting. So they meet in September. Uh, it's not a huge move up at that point. And then after the September meeting, yields are up another 40 to 50 basis points, the 10-year Treasury yield. That's important because uh, policy expectations for the Fed really haven't changed. You know, the long end isn't selling off because investors think the Fed is going to keep hiking. It's also not obvious that yields are rising because investors are worried about inflation. Uh, so when that happens, you say, well, that's going to tighten policy even more. This is term premium. Uh, this is investors demanding a higher yield to hold a longer dated asset. And so that's going to raise borrowing costs. It's going to raise mortgage rates. And that has an effect in slowing the economy, the same effect that the Fed is trying to achieve when they raise interest rates. So you have these Fed officials here saying that this increase in the 10-year yield in the Treasury curve uh, could pretty much substitute for Fed rate increases. And the Dallas Fed president gave a speech on Monday that was important. Lori Logan used to run the markets desk at the New York Fed. And so this is someone who's fairly influential when you think about uh, those dynamics. She's also been hawkish this year, Maria. And so when you have somebody who's hawkish saying maybe we don't have to do so much, uh, you know, I sit up and I take note. Yeah. And we should point out that Lori Logan is going to speak again today at 10 a.m. Eastern. So I, you know, mention that because if she says the same thing that we've been hearing uh, in terms of uh, higher yields, maybe less need to, for the Fed to raise rates, maybe we get even more of, of a rally uh, in stocks. But I was referring to the minutes from the September FOMC meeting a moment ago where it looked like the policymakers were not really focused on the surge in bond yields at that meeting, but instead they were talking talking about higher for longer messaging and, and, and what the auto workers strike and a feared government shutdown would mean. You write officials were divided on future rate hikes and that yields uh, could substitute, uh, rising yields could substitute for the final increase. Are you saying that you expect a pause on the November 1st meeting? I, I do. Ex I, I don't see why they would raise rates in November unless, you know, we were to get some kind of blistering CPI report this morning which folks really aren't talking about. So, yeah, the, the, the communications since the September meeting, you know, the minutes that came out yesterday, they're somewhat dated because a lot of the sell-off that we've seen in the bond market happened after that meeting. And there were two things that struck me about those minutes, Maria. One was that the run-up in yields up until the September meeting really didn't seem to weigh on the deliberations at that meeting. By the right. same token, you know, there had been some concern about growth reaccelerating and that that would make it harder to sustain the progress that we've seen this summer on inflation. And you also didn't hear a lot of or you didn't see a lot of uh, discussion in those minutes about, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, this is going to make it harder for us. So we're going to have to hike more. So those those two things probably offset to some extent. Yeah. So what are your expectations for the CPI? Because, you know, Nick, earlier uh, we were doing the work on the PPI yesterday and it was uh, hotter than expected. It was a uh, once again an indication that the underlying components of of inflation, even though the headline number is off of the highs over the last year, you've got sticky uh, uh, moves in fuel, food, and, and shelter with oil where it is. So the September CPI is out in about uh, 45 minutes. The expectations call for a move of three-tenths of a percent month over month and 3.6 percent year over year. What are you going to be watching for when we get this number in 45 minutes? So, Maria, I'll be looking at core CPI, at takeout, uh, you know, energy and food. Energy has been volatile. Uh, and, you know, on core, uh, the number crunchers are looking at something around a 25 basis point increase from August. So maybe that rounds down to 0.2, maybe that rounds up to 0.3. But if it's, it's, if it's in that ballpark, that's actually a pretty good number. One other thing to remember is that the Fed's preferred gauge is the personal consumption expenditures price index, which we will get uh, at the end of this month. And you can pretty well dis you can see what the PCE number is going to be once you have the PPI, which we got yesterday, as you noted, and then the CPI this morning. 
And the components from the PPI that feed into the PCE measure of inflation, airfares, medical care, uh, those came out yesterday, and they were uh, they were mild. And so, you know, okay. on Wall Street right now, uh, it's it's looking like we could get another mild PCE number, which would be meaningful to the Fed. I see. Okay, Tiana, jump in here. So, Nick, I, I sort of have two part questions for you. One, when you talk about the potential for a blistering CPI number that would make the Fed reconsider a pause, that would make them consider, you know, another rate hike come November. What range would you be looking for? What would that headline CPI and core CPI number need to be? And then also, you know, we have the Fed responding and doing what Washington won't, and then the bond markets responding and doing what the Fed won't. What are the conditions bond-wise and inflation-wise for Washington to seriously want to curtail spending, not just mandatory spending, but also discretionary? Yeah, on the spending question, I think it's a great question. You know, it's it's not clear uh, what's changing the political consensus here to talk about, uh, you know, fiscal restraint. You have mortgage rates rising closer to 8 percent now for the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And you might think that that would lead, you know, mortgage lenders, business leaders to say, hey, wait a minute, we've got to do something to get these interest rates under control. You had the mortgage bankers in the last few days send a letter to Jay Powell, the Fed chair, saying, uh, let's back off on interest rate increases. But if inflation doesn't get under control, you know, that's not going to be great for the housing industry either. On your question about inflation, you know, I'm not sure what number would get them to go in November. I think the bigger question at this point is, could you see uh, such a backsliding in the recent progress, not just with the September CPI, but next month with the October with the October CPI number that would make them really take seriously another hike in December. So let's say we had point fours on core CPI two months in a row, and then they would have to conclude, gee, the progress we thought we were seeing, it's just not there. And really, you'd need to see it, as I said, on the PCE as well. If you had, you know, some high uh, PCE numbers here, that could probably put a December hike back in play. Uh, November, it, you know, it, it would have to just be such an outrageously high number uh, that you would you'd be wondering well what's going on here. Yeah, Nick, we heard the same sentiment from the Federal Reserve's uh, Boston official. Collins said that officials are taking a more patient approach now that rates are near their peak. Uh, Bostic also said the central bank doesn't need to keep tightening unless inflation's descent starts to stall. How much of a factor is this war on Israel uh, in your thoughts? Are the geopolitical events also having an influence on Fed officials? I would say, Maria, not yet. Uh, you know, this, this war um, just started, and we've seen, of course, over the last year how geopolitics can really, uh, you know, influence markets, influence inflation uh, after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. But it's probably too soon to say what this means for, you know, for oil markets. You have seen a flight to safety here. So uh, the sell-off in bonds last week, I mean, last week people were saying, I don't know what's going to stop. Uh, long-term yields from rising here unless something breaks or you have some really weak economic data. Well, we didn't have either of those things, but we had this geopolitical event, and so there, there's been the traditional flight to safety. Uh, but, you know, it's early innings, and it's, it's hard to see uh, immediately how this is going to change the outlook for the U.S. economy. By the way, Nick, the bank stocks have been under pressure for some time now, given this uh, backup in interest rates. Real quick on the earnings season, how does that play into your thinking here? What are your expectations in terms of third quarter reports, which are going to start coming out in, uh, in force, uh, beginning with the banks tomorrow? I'll be interested to hear what banks are saying about credit loss provisions. Yeah. Are they seeing, you know, reasons to... to uh, to set aside more for losses. Obviously, with higher interest rates, the uh, unrealized losses that they're booking on their hold for maturity, uh, you know, securities, that, that doesn't get any better. Yeah, great point. Nick, it's good to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maria. All right, Nick Timrose joining us.